I want to acknowledge and thank our um, panelists today, um, the Minnesota uh, chapter of the Society of Professional um, Journalists um, for co-sponsoring our events today and this week. Um, and I'm going to introduce our panelists um, in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to say that this event is the third in a series of webinar town hall events hosted by the school on the roles and responsibilities of journalists and communication professionals during this time. And today is just the beginning of a conversation around photojournalism. Um, we expect many questions will um, remain. I am just delighted that we have this panel of experts who are willing and able to join us today. Um, as the host of a, this event, I wanna first go over logistics for um, everyone who, is, who may or may not be in their first webinar like this. First, this is a secure uh, webinar and we are recording. Um, and uh, so because it's recording, we're planning on uploading our recording to our website and social media in the next week so that you may share the recording with others and also so that it can be used uh, for future trainings with our students. Second, our panelists will talk for about 30 minutes answering questions that our, uh, our fellow and senior lecturer, Regina uh, McCombs and I have uh, prepared for them. But we also do plan on allowing you to answer some, ask some questions and answer them. Um, to do that, you can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A box. Let me give you some instructions for finding that. If you go down to the bottom of your screen where you see participants, to the right, you will see Q&A. If you click on it and type your question to the panelists, um, you can do so. You can do so with your name or anonymously, whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. You will note that those questions go directly to us, not to everyone. We will select those that we answer live um, later in our conversation. And um, we will answer as many questions as we possibly can. But if you have questions that aren't um, answered, uh, feel free to follow up with us at the school and we will try to get those addressed. You will also note if you've been in Zoom meetings before that there is no chat function for those who are participating in the webinar. That's so that we can hope that you'll focus on um, the questions as well as the conversation with our panelists. Um, now I'm gonna turn this uh, panel over to Regina uh, McCombs, who will, I'll introduce first, um, who is a senior lecturer, I'm sorry, senior fellow and a lecturer in visual journalism at the Hubbard School. Um, and I also will um, help her introduce panelists. Regina, I think that you wanted to show a few photos um, that people had as um, we introduce people. So I'll read off people's names if you want to try to introduce uh, their photos. I'll first um, thank a few people. First, um, we, we uh, and to note the challenge of doing this both live and by Zoom. Um, we hope that our connections hold. Um, if not, we will just move on from um, one panelist to the next as um, this works out. Uh, we have one of our panelists on, uh, Rich uh, Tsang uh, Tadaril, uh, by, uh, by uh, audio only, but um, we are just delighted to have everyone here. Um, I'll now uh, first uh, give introductions to uh, Liz Flores, uh, who is a photojournalist for the Star Tribune. Then um, I will just mention everyone's name and then let uh, Regina take it from here. Evan Frost from NPR. We have Carlos Gonzalez from the Star Tribune. Jerry Holt, um, who is also on our panel. We have Ellen, uh, Ellen Schmidt from the Las Vegas Review Journal, um, who is also a 2019 graduate of our program, who we're delighted to have. Uh, delighted to have. Um, and Rich Song Tadari, who I um, mentioned earlier, also from uh, the Star Tribune. We're delighted to have all of you um, with us today. I'll now turn the program over to Regina McCombs. Um, she will be moderating this, uh, this uh, session uh, so that she can start with a few questions related to uh, what's on uh, the minds of people who are photojournalists at the moment. Regina? Hi there. Um, first, let me just sort of introduce myself briefly and tell you sort of why this is of interest to me and um, sort of the connections uh, on the screen here. Um, this is, I just finished my second year of teaching here at the university. Before that, I um, worked at Minnesota Public Radio as the visuals editor where I had the good sense to hire Evan Frost as first as an intern and then he parlayed that with his skill into uh, being a photojournalist. Um, that's also where I met Ellen. Um, she was an intern there as well. And then I had the um, 
privilege of watching her as the editor of the Minnesota, as the multimedia editor of the Minnesota Daily, and um, watching her work there uh, as I sort of began in academia. Um, but before that, I worked at a place called the Pointer Institute, and before that, I had the privilege of working at the Star Tribune with all of these amazing photographers. And so um, there are connections all across here, so if it seems like we all know each other, you should know that we have a fairly collegial um, photojournalism community here in town, and there are a lot of connections and, um, and relationships and friendships along the way. So, uh, so that is sort of uh, how we all fit together. Um, Jerry has been in this community for a very long time, even though he grew up in Mississippi and spent time in the Marines. Um, Liz is a Midwesterner who we snagged from Wisconsin, and, um, and uh, I have often heard her refer to Carlos as one of the best sports photographers in the country. And uh, so Carlos has been with the Star Tribune for a number of years as well. I'm not gonna out you there, uh, Carlos. Rich also has been, uh, not quite as long, but also been at Star Tribune for a while and has, uh, in the last couple of years in particular, run a lot of national awards for his work. Uh, oh, Liz is from New Mexico, thank you. Uh, well, you spent time in Wisconsin. We snagged you from over there. Uh, anyway, Rich has um, received a lot of awards for his work, um, particularly in covering um, Standing Rock and uh, the Rohingya. And I know a lot of the people here uh, actually spent time at Standing Rock and also covered um, the protests around um, the death of Philando Castile. Um, which is where I'm going to start since that was, we're coming up on the fourth anniversary of that, which I'm, I was shocked when I sort of double checked the date on that. Um, so after, so given the situation here with the death of George Floyd and um, at the hands of a police officer and the sort of protests that happened um, over the last two weeks, um, I kind of wanted to start with this idea of you know, we don't have protests every day in Minnesota. How does sort of, how in general is covering a protest different from sort of the day-to-day -day work that you do? Jerry, I'll start with you. Oh, uh, yeah, I, it's very different. When the uh, Philando Castillo situation happened, actually the next day I was on a flight to Japan. So I, I completely missed all of that and I'm happy that I did. Um, but it's it's very different. Just the preparation is is different, and the, it's the unknowns that you that you have to face, and and uh, trying to figure out how to stay safe, trying to figure out the logistics of how to get images back to the newspaper in a timely fashion. So all of that's different. Um, traveling as light as you possibly can when you go into a situation, because you may you, chances are you're probably going to be running majority of the time, but. It's, it's very different. There's the, the lack of planning sometimes can be, or the, not, I shouldn't say the lack of planning, but having no plan because you don't know what to expect is very different. Um, how about you, Liz? You do a lot of sports and a lot of um, community coverage. How is something like this different for you? Well, on a daily basis, you know, we kind of have an idea of what we're going to be shooting the night before, and we have a synopsis of what's going on. But when we go into a situation like Philando Castillo or George Floyd, we have no um, expectations and we really don't know what we're going to be facing once we get there. So um, given all of that, um, what are you trying to do while you're out there, while you're sort of covering these events? What's your sort of goal, I guess? Is to go out there and shoot what we see without any, uh, I mean, without any uh, preconceived ideas and um, just go out and document what's going on. Given that there are so many people out there with cameras that are documenting, um, how is what you guys are doing different um, from all the people out there, whether it's um, the people who are joining in or the people who've come just with cameras to take pictures, um, sort of how is what you do different than that? Carlos? Um, it's different the way that we're, as, as journalists, we're not there taking a cause or a stand for anything. You know, someone goes there uh, as maybe as part of the protest and is shooting things for themselves and maybe posting things for themselves. 
they're there for that. Um, you know, we're simply there just to try to show people what we're seeing for people that can't be there. Um, and I think that's maybe the, the, the most basic thing of it. It's, it's interesting that um, just the other day, I, I had a young man come up to me. He didn't ask me what media outlet I was from or, or anything like that. He asked me for my Instagram account, my handle for Instagram. Um, it's just, that's just different when you've been in this business as long as I have, it's, it's very different um, because there's so many cameras out there, like Regina said, it's just, it's very different um, why people choose to photograph what they do. Um, as a journalist, as a photojournalist, just Carlos is saying, we're, we're there trying to tell a story of a historical event that's happening in our city. Um, so there's no, there's no entertainment value in my mind when I'm photographing these situations. Um, it's, it's not just something to show up to be cool for to, to get a picture of George Floyd's, uh, get a portrait there. It's just, the mindset is just different. And it's, we're, we're trying to tell stories of a community that's in pain. We're trying to tell stories of a community that's uh, without taking sides, without forming an opinion, um, about right or wrong, but we're trying to tell a story about how uh, the death of a man could happen in 2020 in Minneapolis by the police department and that struggle that's taken place for many, many years. How does it continue to happen? Um, that's, that's my vision of it. That's what I'm thinking about when I'm photographing this situation and try to remain as neutral as I possibly can, but still try and get that message of how did we get to this point in time? Yeah, Rich, how about you? I'm gonna throw it. What do you feel like you're trying to do out there? <clears throat> well, one of the first, can you hear me? Yep. One of the first things I try to do when I um, get to the a scene is to take a, the temperature of the crowd and what is going on and where it might be headed. And I just go with that and I try to use empathy and um, as my number one tool kit, tool in my box. So I'm trying to capture what people are feeling and it doesn't matter whether it's from the far right or the far left. I'm there to record it. And so that's my job, I feel like. But, you know, you can be, as a photojournalist, you can be objective, but doesn't mean you're devoid of feelings, you know, in your pictures or about what you're photographing. Evan, I see you nodding at that. What do you? Yeah, I think, um... In addition to what Rich and Jerry are talking about in kind of looking at the story in the long term and documenting this, this what we're going through and the pain that people are experiencing, I, I found what I was most useful for, especially in the first couple days of the most recent protest, was just keeping the city informed about what is happening where. Because with, with our access to social media and just being on the ground, um, I, I just felt very useful in letting people know this is happening in this neighborhood here. These people are moving this way. This building is being lit on fire. And I felt like there was just kind of in the beginning a utility to that as well. Just letting people in different neighborhoods know what was happening. This year is particularly challenging for multiple, multiple reasons, but the coronavirus being a big one. I know you guys were all really meticulous about safety concerns around COVID-19. Um, how did you sort of handle that kind of added level of um, need for protection, I guess, uh, in with this going on, with it being so chaotic and um, developing so quickly? Um, so there was a lot of consideration that went into covering this stuff uh, with the added complication of a pandemic. I think we were all really used to wearing masks, wearing gloves, hand sanitizing, cleaning our gear, all that stuff before the protest started. So that was kind of an easy transition. But when it came to the comes to the actual protests, 
which are far different from Minneapolis. I just want to say it's not a citywide thing. It's there's two or three events going on and they last, you know, eight hours max. It's not the whole city is taken over. Um, but aside from that, there's no way to stay six feet from people if you want to make poignant images. So for me, it's just a matter of like limiting that time and wearing as much PPE as possible um, and like knowing when to step away. And um, yeah, it's just a really big risk that we're all taking, I think, to cover this. Carlos, how about you? You talked about that a little bit the other day. Yeah, the same thing there. It was interesting because, you know, we were all so cautious um, professionally in our personal lives um, during the start about, you know, wearing masks and sanitizing and cleaning gear and all that stuff. And then it became quickly apparent that the first day of the protest when it started, it was just such a gathering of people. And the march had started down to the third precinct from uh, Cup Foods um, that that all kind of went out the window as a sense of like, okay, well, this is what it's going to be and all these people are here and there's really no way of documenting this without being next to people. And, and that's how it was. And as things escalated throughout the days, then, um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously we always wear masks and I always clean my gear and all that kind of stuff, but socially distancing was not happening. Did that add to the tension for you or did you just kind of have to let it go? And, and that, but that went by fast in a sense. That was like the last thought in my head, just because just dealing with everything that was going on, especially when it, things got pretty intense um, that first week. Um, there was other things on my mind besides, uh, besides COVID. Russ, you guys feel that way too? You just kind of had to let it go or did you kind of, was that constantly sort of hanging over your head? I think, I think once the action starts, your mindset just completely changes it's it's kind of an afterthought at that point um there's there's really no time to your, your energy and your mind your, your focus and everything is is on what you're photographing and it's very difficult to think about anything else during that time period so i think it just kind of went out of the window from everybody that was there unfortunately so what are the safety issues for you guys when you're out there if you're having to let covid 19 issues go uh, for me, the biggest issue in, in that situation was when, when people would get gassed and then people would take the mask off, you know, that's, and you're, you're in that kind of close knit environment. There's no social distancing, distancing, distancing. You're so close to each other and everybody's running and everybody's coughing. And then, uh, you know, within two or three minutes after when it settles down and it comes to your mind, just, just what happened. But at that time, you're just trying to escape. You're just trying to, you know, trying to breathe. Yeah, um, unrelated to COVID-19, I think the, the biggest thing that I was aware of, and we saw this on the 35 Bridge, was just vehicles. Um, no matter what crowd you're in, there are people revving their engines everywhere. People are driving around on closed streets. Um, and there were just a lot of, I, I don't know what else to call them besides just like, when the crowd just jumps, when you think a, a vehicle's coming and you're trying to figure out the situation, it's just, uh, you think of Charlottesville and how that could really happen anywhere. And it's, it's pretty unnerving. Yeah, for those who may not remember, a guy drove his car or truck, I can't remember, directly into some protesters in Charlottesville and um, it's pretty horrifying. Um, Liz, you were out there for a while, I know, alone. Um, what were your sort of, what, were, what was going through your head in terms of safety that you were thinking about? You know, when you walk into these situations, you really don't know what to expect. And I think Rich hit a, an important point about your taking the temperature of a situation. You, you kind of know when things might get heightened. And um, for example, I'm walking, and I talked about this before about the logistics of, it's not just, hey, let's get in your car, go park in a parking lot, get out, jump and take pictures. It's not like that. During those situations, so many people were going to these areas that you had to find you know, where to park. So there was one case where I had to park like four or five blocks away of where like on university where the target was one night and it was dusk so it's starting to get dark and 
I'm walking toward the smoke and I'm walking down University Avenue and there's people jumping out of stores and you're trying to focus, you know, on, on any kind of movement that's going on around you. But at the same time, you're trying to gauge, you know, whether you're safe or not. And sometimes being in a huge crowd doesn't necessarily mean that you're safe. And, um, you know, as a female photographer, you're sometimes being in a big crowd is not a good thing because you might be being groped at. And, um, and I think my, my biggest fear, well, I had two fears. At one point I started fearing the police because I felt like, you know, these people were protesting with signs and their voices. They didn't have AK-47 strapped to them, but yet they were still getting shot with tear gas balls. And um, so that was fearful because I was in that crowd. And then another thing was, you know, having to walk back in the night in the darkness to your car and, and not have a lot of equipment on me. So, you know, I don't know their emotions are really intense and heightened. So you don't know what you're going to run into. And especially when you're by yourself, it, it, that gets a little fearful and being a female. And uh, at some point, this, our editors started pairing us up with people. I think by the time we got to the 35 bridge, um, someone thought to let's pair up photographers and or reporters and photographers. Yeah, I want to come back to the idea of police in a second. But before I do that, I want to talk to Rich because um, Rich, you have a little bit of a uh, maybe a what not to do story here. Um, I'm going to pull up this photo. And since we can't see you, why don't you tell us um, sort of what you, the drama you had um, one of those first nights? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Carlos was there. And he was he was in the crowd, which is a smart thing to do actually that night. Um, so, but as I head back to my car to, I forgot why I did, but there's an RV in a dark parking lot across from the third precinct. And I saw a bunch of people um, discussing looting and planning to burn down the Arby's. And that was one of the aspects of the coverage I wanted to get. Um, cause I had earlier gotten a picture of, you know, the looting inside the target and, but the difference was inside the target was during the daytime and there were a lot of people going in now. There are a lot of exit options. Um, it was quote unquote safer to photograph there, but this, I just was tired and I wasn't thinking clearly and looking back, I would walk this back and not do it again. For sure, because uh, I ended up, uh, you know, like uh, one guy uh, cornered me and asked me why I was photographing a crime, which is a perfectly rational question from a criminal. So, and I said, uh, I, I didn't have my press pass hanging on me because I didn't want that. I realized hanging with all the number of uh, violent anarchists around, that's kind of like a, the end of the story. If they realize you're pressed, they just destroy your gear and there's no discussion. So anyways, I, at that point, I started negotiating my way out. I told them I was a, you know, a lover of photography and history, and this is history. So I'm a, I was there to document it, which was true. And then that was not good enough. And then we kept talking. So at some point I got one of my cameras back with the lens. I gave him the card, I already transmitted it. I said, look, take this card. I didn't take any pictures with this camera. And then I, he wanted my Leica. And so as he was talking to me, because he said, oh, I saw you shoot pictures with that. I slipped the lens off and the disc into my pocket. And then we kept talking. And then at some point just, we came at an impasse and he just, you know, he said, you're not leaving without the, uh, me taking that camera. So he took the camera and tossed it in the fire. So, yeah, I mean, 
you know, you want to do your job um, in showing all sides of the story and to be fair to the issues, but obviously you don't want to, you know, risk your life doing it. So I did want to touch on this idea of that um, Liz mentioned this idea of um, interactions with the police. Um, this particular set of protests here and around the country has really sort of, I think we've seen far more police aggression toward the press. Um, and um, how, how has, has this felt different to you? Um, Ellen, I'm going to come to you in a minute, but um, you know, how has this, how has this, did it feel different with the police this time around? We saw them arrest people live on the air. Um, Jerry? Did it feel different? Um, you know, when you cover a shooting or something and it's a crowd gathering up, you have a tendency to make sure you stay safe so you, you stay within police sight normally. That's kind of how you stay safe when you cover a normal shooting. Um, you know, for me, this is kind of a this is kind of a good thing, in the sense that that people are aware of how police can react at times. Um, I've always known this to be a problem. Um, I've always I've been targeted before by police. I've had guns drawn on me before by police. I've been thrown on the ground with my face on the ground and, and people looking up at me as though I'm a criminal, simply for doing my job. So it's kind of, for me, it's kind of like a, it's not a surprise. It's kind of like, okay, guys, yeah, you, you're seeing what I've experienced for a very long time. So, yeah. so for me, it's not by no means a surprise. It, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter when you look like me. It doesn't really matter what profession you're in, whether you have a camera or you're, still, you're a photographer or you're a lawyer, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, and so the world is seeing what I've seen for a very long time. Um, and, and you're still trying to do your job. You're trying to be a photographer. You, you just, you're just trying your best to, to come away with that storytelling image. You're trying to be fair on both sides. Even in the midst of all of that, you still hold on to those values as a photojournalist because that's what you believe in your heart. And I still believe that. So, but not surprised about, about the reaction at all because like I say, it's been, it's very clear to me. It's been like this way for a very long time. Yeah, you've had some horrible just incidents with police and just you just trying to be a photographer I know and it's just yeah yeah and the thing is the thing is um the only reason we're having this conversation now is because I was in in some situation I was able to like Rich negotiated his way out of that Arby's I was able to negotiate my way out of situations by being as calm as I possibly could be and not being reactionary because I knew if I was a reactionary, I knew I would have been shot. So it's, it's, you get conditioned to how you cover an event based on how you're treated. When you, Rich talks about measuring the temperature, the temperature is always hot in a lot of cases I go to. So I'm very, very used to that. I understand that. I understand the dynamics of that. Um, and it's sad, you know, one photographer I know lost an eyesight, Carolyn Cole one of the best photographers I've ever seen was injured, you know? And, and they're so shocked by the fact that they're injured. When Justine Damon was killed in South Minneapolis or Southwest Minneapolis, part of the city, when she called the police that night, I am sure she called thinking that there's no way I'm going to be harmed by this. They're here to serve and protect me. So her own innocence of that probably cost her life. And that's, you know, um, you know, you're a journalist, you're a photographer, you're this, but first of all, you're a human being, you're a person. 
And that identity sticks with you throughout your life, wherever you go, what you do. And I hope that um, the merits of how I'm judged is by how I treat people, not by how I look to someone. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by you know, the reaction of the police at all. I'm actually a little bit surprised they didn't, they didn't do this the first couple of nights. They didn't act so, weren't so aggressive the first couple of nights to the point where it, you know, what did it put him begin to escalate to the point that it did? Yeah, there's, I think, so many questions about police handling out there of this. But um, Liz, how about for you? Did this seem, this feel different with the relationship with the police on this event? I personally think so. I just remember, you know, North Minneapolis um, after that incident that, um, even Philando Castillo is, I remember going and thinking, I will be safe if there are police present. You know, that um, to me, in my mind, the police are to protect you. And um, this time around, I, I almost felt like they saw us as a target, you know? And I, I don't even know whether or not having a, a huge press pass on you even really made a difference this time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think it was quite a bit different than the, than the previous years. Ellen, why don't you uh, tell us what happened to you the night of the protests in Vegas? Um, yeah, so first, thank you, Jerry, for saying that. That really um, is an eloquent way to describe this. And I think that part of the reason that I was surprised by what happened to me um, getting arrested in Las Vegas is because I am a white woman and the police have never, ever seen me as a threat. So I've never felt that kind of fear from them before. I mean, I grew up, my best friend's dad was a police officer. I've never had anything but trust for them. Um, until becoming a journalist and until that specific moment. Um, so yeah, I was just covering a protest. Um, things heated up, police charged protesters and they arrested me as if I was also a protester. Um, that is a very embarrassing photograph, but that is, that is really out there. Um, and yeah, so me and another photojournalist were arrested side by side, showed press credentials, um, shouted we were journalists, cited our First Amendment rights, and they did not care. Um, and we spent the night in jail. Um, and I think one of the worst parts about it is realizing that all of the people, there were 80 other people arrested that night, have the same First Amendment rights as us. So it, it's just a really um, frustrating thing to realize that you're doing your job and um, are also just in the same boat as these people to the police um, who just really don't care um, if you're a journalist anymore. And we're seeing that all over the country. It's, it's not just here in Las Vegas or in Minneapolis. It's a press badge does not mean anything. Um, and I think that's a shame. I know you can't sort of discuss the details of this, but I, I feel like that is sort of a pretty significant difference from four years ago, but maybe I'm wrong um, on sort of the level of police aggression toward the um, journalists. Did you, yeah. So um, did you guys feel like you needed to then stay out of their way from then on? Were you trying to sort of not be with the police? Can I talk again? Yes, you can. Um, so I went and photographed another protest like two nights later after being arrested and I was definitely more scared of them. I was definitely more aware of where I was in the crowd and moving with protesters, um, realizing that they were not going to even try to distinguish journalists from protesters. So like that means staying behind the crowd, going up to get the shot of the front of the crowd and like the police standoff or whatever right away and then moving back. Um, and it, what it really means is you're not gonna be there to cover some of the moments um, because it's just simply not possible to put yourself in between police and protesters. Um, 
like for instance, the night that I was arrested, I was literally hugging a telephone pole to stay safe and that didn't keep me safe. And I just, I think that um, the fact that they're not going to even try to distinguish people, it means that we really have to change the way that we do our jobs. Um, and I, I don't really see any other solution to it. Like I was covering a guy, a protester who got shot that evening after two nights after my arrest and I got charged by police. They had not taped off the area. People weren't protesting. They had shot a protester. Everyone fleed and me and another journalist went up to take photos and they charged at us with guns for taking photos. I think that's a perfect explanation of like, you're not going to be able to walk up to the officer and be like, officer, what happened anymore? It's just that has gone out the window. Okay, sort of related to this, I think, um, uh, there has been a group of photographers, um, not necessarily photojournalists, but a group of photographers circulating um, um, what they're calling a manifesto, asking journalists or telling journalists really not to show the face of protesters uh, for fear that the police will use these to harass or attack um, the protesters, especially people of color. Um, so, and part of that includes the suggestion of only showing masked faces or protesters from behind or in large groups. Um, and I'm really curious to hear your reaction to that sort of um, suggestion that, that, you know, we try to balance safety of the protesters with the work that we're trying to do. Jerry? Start with you. I'm going to make the rounds on this one. Mm. I think if you're legit, if you're a protest or protesting for a cause, I don't think you have that concern as much as if you're a person that's looting or you're burning buildings. Um, um, if you're burning buildings, I, I really don't care if your face is being shown or not. If you're looting, if you're destroying people's lives, I don't really care if your face is being shown, shown or not. You're in a public street. This is going down. It is what it is. That's that's my feeling. If you're if you're legitimately protesting against police brutality, I don't think majority of those people care about their faces being shown. The sort of discussion is, you know, is it fair to uh, highlight people of color in these situations where they might be more vulnerable to sort of future follow up? Yeah. But I think Rich Song's analogy of that was trying to show both sides to that. And I think that's what he did. He had the set of pictures that he had inside of the, the target versus the set of pictures that he had inside of the Arby's. I, I saw a couple of things that troubled me while I was out. Uh, I would see situations where people would come and they would start fires or they would kick in doors and then they'd walk away. And then a large part, then a large amount of African American people would come out running with with goods in their hands. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, I don't. I don't know if it's right or wrong to photograph them or show their faces. I I I struggle with that. I can't give you a definite answer on that. Liz, how about you? How do you sort of think about that, or is that a realistic? question or, or request of photographers, photojournalists? Um, you know, I'm sent there to document this uh, historical event. I'm sent there by my editors. So I would expect and hope that they, I would leave that decision to them to make that decision. Um, I know there was a, a, a photo that I took where the police were, were shooting and it, it was, I noticed that it was mostly white people that were running. But there was a, there was a situation, I remember, I remember seeing um, some, uh, along university, some people jumping out of a, uh, of a store. And I remember turning one, the photo in and it's a young African American kid coming out of the store but he didn't have anything with him. And then I thought to myself, is this gonna make him look like he was looting? You know, it, part of me, I, 
and you, you don't, you're so caught in the moment, you're not going to run after him and say, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir, can, can, um, what were you doing in there, you know? Um, <laughs> so I, I guess, I mean, that's a legitimate question. Do we as the media show, um, uh, as criminals or are we documenting the story? And in my, in my opinion, we're document we're documenting the story, you know, we're there to, you know, we're, again, we're not on either the right or the left. Uh, that's not our, our job to decipher that. And if there are questions regarding um, the criminal activity, that should be um, up to our editors to decide. But just at the peaceful protests, I mean, do you feel like you, how does that play in? Evan, how about for you? Do you, have you thought about this at all? Or is it sort of too abstract? I don't. Um, honestly, I, I, I'm still gathering my thoughts about this and I'm trying to read as much as I can from as many different perspectives as I can. Um, I think, yeah, I, I really don't know. I don't have a good answer, but I, I do think that we all need to keep kind of evaluating how the structure of white supremacy plays into legacy media and how it plays into everything that we consume. But. No, I, I, I haven't had enough time to process this and really come up with a good answer. Carlos? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to take away from this. I, I, I appreciate the concerns of some people that don't um, have a true understanding of what we're doing to say, hey, well, you know, you don't know what these people have done. Can you just block out their faces or things like that? And I understand that viewpoint, but a reason why that doesn't happen is that one, we are there documenting what's going on and, you know, this is the middle of the day outside of the protest, you know, the same right that allows people to protest is the same right that allows us to photograph them. And not just myself as a journalist, anyone. So you're in a public place, you kind of, you kind of give up some privacy. That's just, that's just understood. Um, and then there's the concern about, if you think about historically, if this approach had been taken, you would have wiped out 150 years of photojournalism in the sense of like all these images, think about your head, if like no face was shown, no image, you need people's faces, you need people's eyes. This is how you, you get a sense of what they're feeling. You see the emotion, you see what's going through their heads even from an image, you know? And if you take that away and just shoot the back of people's heads and in a perfect world, this is how we do it. You, you're, you're taking away what's really happening there. Two, if you're really concerned about people's safety, something's coming down the road, again, if you're not doing anything wrong at a protest, which is perfectly legal, um, the large majority of people nowadays have their own cameras. And I saw people, even while crimes were happening, were live streaming and taking selfies and posing for pictures with their friends as things were, as the police precinct is burning, as the store is on fire, as all these things are happening. Like right in front of me, they're doing it as well. I have pictures of them taking pictures of themselves while this is going on. Uh, another point three is that you're forgetting that around, just in public spaces, but around a police station, the amount of surveillance that's already in there and then technology such as facial recognition. I mean, you all have Facebook, you, you tag your friends so easily. If they know who your friends are before you have a chance to tag them or see them, do you not think that police have access to more sophisticated technology than that in the sense of around a, a precinct? I mean, there are ways for people to be seen. I mean, you, you, you give up. <laughs> if you think you're anonymous when you're walking around, you're not really paying attention because there's, there's just a lot of ways to, and especially around a police precinct. So. I don't know, that's some things to think about that I think are often overlooked in the sense of, you know, maybe coming at us because our images are maybe visible and people are seeing them, but in the sense of like, we're just trying to document what's going on and you're kind of forgetting the big picture of if you're truly cared about people's privacy, understand that there's other ways for people to be seen in public. And just to follow on what you said, I really, I've been, thinking about this a lot um, and sort of trying to process. And I went, I just happened across a photo gallery from the Atlantic magazine from um, sort of the covering a bunch of the stuff. And it, it sort of looked to me like the photo editor um, was trying to sort of keep those suggestions in mind. The problem with it then was it was wide shot after wide shot after wide shot. And I suddenly didn't care. Right. It's just like and there was a shot of the backs of people's heads and there was this kind of a medium shot of a bunch of masked people. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I don't know these people. I don't connect. And then suddenly in the middle of that, there was this tight shot of this teenager 
and she was so upset and she was yelling and she had braces and you know it was just there was just something about seeing her face and seeing the braces that sort of emphasized her age and her you know her sadness and anger and all of that and suddenly I'm back in right suddenly I'm connected to this story again because I can see this girl and I can connect to like you said, to the emotion of what she's feeling and what this means to her that I don't get from the wide shot after wide shot after wide shot. I mean, I'm for showing scale, but you just can't keep showing scale and scale. You just, then you just sort of lose the connection to the individuals that this is meaningful for. Also in a situation like this too, I mean, there's a lot happening. And to think that we can self-edit while these things are happening, it's like, oh my God, the police is on fire, but I'm gonna take a picture like this and not show the fire department, but the mini, like, that's not realistic in a sense. Um, there's a different discussion to be had about what pictures are published in a sense of like, I saw looting from people of color, I saw looting from white people, I saw, I saw looting from the whole gamut, right? And so you wanna be accurate in what you're showing when you're showing those images. So that's a discussion to be had and that's, that's legitimate. Um, I'll tell you, and it's just, uh, I got an email from someone. Um, one of the images I took was of looting of a liquor store. This is happening in the middle of the day. And in the image, there is several people kind of around. There's just one person walking by, a uh, person of color, just walking. I don't think they had anything in hand. There's a white person masked, graffitiing on the wall of the uh, liquor store, a white person walking into the liquor store, and then a young teenage, I find out later, teenage white girl running across with a bottle of liquor in her hand across the image. So I got an email from a person who actually knew the girl. Um, and apparently the, the mother of the girl saw the image like the next day, like reading the paper in the morning and told me a little story about that, which um, I thought was interesting. So, but there's, yeah, again, there's a discussion to be had about what images are used and published, but while it's happening, you document it all and those can essentially have that there because you don't have a chance to go back in time and take pictures and get, oh, I wish I would have shot that or Richard would have shot that or, there's no time for self-editing, especially in a situation that's fluid and chaotic, really, it's chaotic. Um. Yeah, I, I completely agree, actually, and maybe it's because I spent time as an editor, but it feels like a lot to ask of photographers on the scene when things are crazy and violent and, um, you know, you're trying to sort of stay safe and, 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 and capture what's happening, to ask you to sort of edit in the moment, I think is a lot. I think that is the responsibility of editors and photo editors need to be sort of talking about, you know, sort of their role. And I think that is kind of the role here, right? I, I don't think we can ask photographers to sort of have to do this um, editing. I saw one comment that said, well, you know, you need to examine your motivations while you're out there. And it's like, well, speaking from the times I've been out in crazy situations, my motivation is to get an image or video, you know, to stay safe, to, to tell the truth. And kind of beyond that, I, I don't have time for other motivations, right? So I think the role of editing is, um, is really critical in this discussion too. I also, I think uh, with COVID-19 here now, uh, normally a newsroom situation, you have a gathering of people to get together and they actually look at the photos as a group. Uh, I mean, we're looking at them electronically. It's just different. It's a different feel when you actually have that person next to you editing. So I think that's contributed to a lot of the concerns. Um, mm. That's just... Uh, just an observation. Yeah, I know, Evan, you sort of touched on the idea of it's really different when there's not a newsroom to go back to or to talk to or. Yeah, we, um, well, there's only two of us at NPR. There's Christine and I, and we have a number of freelance photographers as well. So it it's uh, just part of the process that sometimes we don't get eyes on everything that's going out <laughs> or something will go straight on my Twitter account or onto Instagram because you're there and you need to, you need to get photos out somehow and through our workflow since we don't have a print publication often our digital producers can rip straight from my twitter so that i end up self-editing standing behind an arby's looking at my camera and tweeting and it's obviously not the most rigorous or thoughtful 
editing process. And but uh, unfortunately, in the in these when you're short staffed in these breaking news situations where you have to have your head on a swivel, that's just kind of how it goes. But I'm going to try to be more thoughtful about that in the future. Jerry, I saw you nodding there. Yeah, he, he's right. You know that that, that instant. Sometimes they, the instant photograph that you send out is not always the most accurate. In, in terms of the bigger picture of the story, it's not always. Uh, the best way to do it. Um, it's in the publishing. And sometimes when we're we're trying to be first, a lot of the times we I think we make mistakes by doing that and not truly understanding what's really going on. Yeah, can I say something about the blurring faces issue? Yeah. I think um, that it's not a simple answer and it needs to be a an ongoing conversation in the industry as surveillance has changed. Um, Obviously, legally, protesters do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy that's just gone. Um, but I think as people who claim to have empathy for people, we need to consider their fears. Um, we don't, we keep survivors of sexual assault anonymous. We do not take photos of people experiencing homelessness all the time to maintain their dignity. And although we know that there's probably a greater surveillance of these people who are protesting, it's a legitimate fear for their life. They legitimately fear for their life based on this. And I think that's something we have to take into account. Um, even, if, even if we think we know better or we don't know better, I, it, it's just something I can't leave out of the conversation. And additionally, like maintaining or getting consent from these people is so important. And I know most of the time things are moving too fast for us to grab names from every single person, but I wouldn't publish a day-to-day -day photo of someone who asked me not to publish their photo or didn't want to give me their name. So I don't really see how that's any different here other than the fast pace of things. Um, as far as blurring faces go, absolutely not. We cannot have a history book full of blurred faces. That's ridiculous. But I do think that um, not every image needs to be made and we can, we can take into account the concerns without compromising um, the truth. And I think you bring up a really important point here. Well, several, but one is, you know, that sort of when we talk to people, right, we get a sense of why they're there, when we get their names, when we do that sort of basic news gathering, I think that's very different than the people who are just coming out to take interesting pictures. I think when we, um, you know, sort of take the time that most of us do, again, when appropriate, um, to try to get people's names and why they're there, then that sort of implies consent too, right? When they give us their names and talk to us. And, and I think it sort of is the work of journalism to, um, to do that. Um, so I think we may have to leave it at that given our time here. Um, Alicia, did you want to, um, did we miss any questions here that we need to answer? I think we kind of touched on at least most of them. I think so. We had a lot of questions that were a little bit overlapping. So I hope and I thank all the panelists who answered uh, great questions uh, related to considerations of how each of you keep yourself safe and I, on behalf of the school and the faculty, I, I'm so grateful to have you here and, um, and, and want you to continue to be safe and, and to um, practice in this way. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts and the controversies in the field. We know it's legal, um, but um, ethics and thinking through how ethical principles of minimizing harm while telling the truth and covering the truth well um, is always a challenge that we teach our students. Um, thank you as well for talking about the um, ways that you think about um, kind of your how your perspective, your personal perspective and experience with your interactions with the police really uh, has uh, carried into your interactions um, with them and how your perspective on today. And uh, Ellen, I'm so grateful to have you as a young alum who um, has experienced some of this as well as other participants, Jerry, Liz, Carlos, Evan, Rich, all of you who um, really enriched the, our classroom experience for our students. And we're just so grateful to have you as local professional experts working with Regina. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for participating with us. And before you leave, um, I want to ask our audience, and I'll ask our assistant from Rachel for this, to um, a couple poll questions. First, to see if they found um, this, uh, if they would be interested in receiving email about upcoming um, Hubbard School events. Um, if so, we will certainly share them out. And I just want to point out as well that we do have events.
coming up um, both this afternoon and, um, and tomorrow as part of our teach-in town halls on the subject matter. Recordings will be um, available. So I appreciate you, um, you weighing in and being willing to participate. And then our second question is um, uh, that we uh, want to ask people um, about is uh, if they found uh, this uh, panel uh, helpful in explaining the topics under consideration. I know that I learned a great deal um, from each of you and uh, value your experience uh, and those who are um, being able to give us responses right now are, are weighing in and um, sharing this level as well. So thank you all um, so much for your time. I hope you'll consider uh, joining us again for future events. I hope um, and uh, that any of you um, who are on the panel, please feel free to call on us, um, me or other members of the school um, to be as assist uh, an assistance um, to you as well um, during this time and in the months ahead. We're just so grateful for your participation. And um, with that, I will uh, reach out later. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.